Ah, I was instructed to start from the beginning. So, where is, okay. So I will talk about, I will start with infinite dimensional Lie algebras. Suppose that we have a Lie algebra L over a field F, and uh, suppose that it is Z graded. So it is a direct sum of subspaces indexed by integers. Z graded means that whenever you multiply uh, i's and j's component, the indices add. Once we want to study infinite dimensional objects, let us start with those that grow not too fast. Suppose that all components are finite dimensional, and moreover, their dimensions grow polynomially. So they are bounded above by a certain polynomial in I. What can we say about such objects? Uh, if you want a classification, then it is natural to assume that they are graded simple. Graded simple means that they are allowed to contain ideals, but they are not allowed to contain graded ideals other than zero and the whole algebra. Well, let's consider some examples. Example one. Let G be a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra. Uh, let's assume that the characteristic of the ground field is zero and that F is algebraically closed. You know, Arnold used to say that it is very easy to recognize an algebraist. He, algebraists always start their lectures with uh, phrase, let F be an algebraically closed field of zero characteristic. Um, okay, this is a very classical object. Um, well known and still very deep. So let G be a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra and let us consider the algebra of Laurent polynomials over G. So this is a direct sum of these homogeneous components. Their dimensions are all the same. They're equal to the dimension of G. So they grow certainly polynomially. And since G was simple, this algebra is graded simple. It has some modification. We could consider some automorphism of finite order and consider fixed elements. I will just try a twisted version of the above. Okay. Then third examples. We could consider the algebra of derivations of polynomials, of the algebra of polynomials in finitely many variables. Well, it is graded, it is, it is known that every derivation is the sum mm, of this type. If you say that the degree of every ti is 1, the degree of every partial derivative is negative 1, then it becomes graded. And it is easy to see that the dimensions grow as polynomial of degree m. This algebra also has well-known subalgebras, uh, which leave certain forms invariant, special, Hamiltonian, and contact. These algebras are called Cartan algebras in honor of Elie Cartan. Fourth example. Let us now consider the famous Verasoro algebra, the algebra of derivations of Laurent polynomials in one variable. Well, it is a direct sum of, let us say, ti plus 1, d over dt. It is z graded, and dimensions of, dimension of every component is equal to 1. It, uh, this algebra and those algebras have very interesting central extensions. Well, so this problem, the classification of graded simple algebras of polynomial growth, was considered in the 60s by Victor Katz, who proved that with certain technical restrictions, every 
graded simple Lie algebra of polynomial growth is one of these four algebras. And he conjectured that if you drop the technical restriction, which actually ruled out the Verasor algebra, then you will just get only the Verasor algebra. And this conjecture was proved in 92 by Olivier Mathieu. Very complicated proof. Uh, I guess more than 100 pages and in Vintionis. Well, so now we can say that um, all graded Lie algebras, almost all, that uh, prove to be important in some other areas of mathematics just found their, their place in this classification. Okay, now let us talk about super algebras. What are super algebras? Super algebras were introduced in the 50s in algebraic topology, but modest mathematicians called them graded algebras. Then in the 70s, uh, some connection with supersymmetry was found, and physicists introduced a more marketable terminology, super algebras. So it does not mean that they are superior to other algebras. <laughs> it comes from supersymmetry. So what are super algebras? Let A be an algebra, and suppose that it is graded by a cyclic group of order two. So it is a direct sum of two subspaces. The first subspace is referred to as even subspace. This is odd subspace. Whenever you multiply two even elements, you get an even element. Even times odd is odd, and the product of two odd elements is even. That's it. This is a super algebra. Example. I'll give two examples. Let us consider matrices, which are divided into blocks. This block of size M, this block of size N. It has a natural grading block diagonal. Algebras are even, and off-diagonal matrices are odd. So this is a super algebra. Another example. Let us consider Grassmann algebra, which is presented by generators and relators. These are Grassmann variables. Their squares are equal to zero, and they anti-commute. Then it is easy to see that the basis of this algebra consists of ordered products. If the length is even, we say that the element is even. If the length is odd, we say that it is odd. So this algebra is a, becomes a super algebra. We could consider also countably many variables. So grasp algebra. Now let V be a class of algebras. defined by identities. The so-called variety of algebras. For example, the class of all associative algebras is defined by the identity of associativity. The class of commutative algebras. The class of Lie algebras is defined by two identities, anti-commutativity and Jacobi identity. OK. Well. And I need to introduce one more object. Let A be a super algebra. Its Grassmann envelope is the following algebra. Mm, sorry. <laughs> OK. Tensor product. This is called Grassmann envelope. of a super algebra. Now, defin important definition. We say that a super algebra A is a V super algebra if its Grassmann envelope lies in the variety V. So if you start with a class of 
Lie algebras, you could get a definition of a Lie super algebra. If you start with a variety of associative algebras, you get an associative super algebra and so on. The classification of all finite dimensional simple associative superalgebras or an algebraically closed field was obtained in the 50s by CTC Wall, a topologist. There are only two classes of associative simple superalgebras. The superalgebras that I have already mentioned, they are called M, M plus N and another class. Let us consider algebra, uh, matrices of size 2n and divide them into blocks. And this will be AA and here BB. That's it. Since then, this theory was reproved many, many times in various papers. Well, then there began a saga, especially in the 70s, when people got interested in superalgebras. And physicists with their mighty intuition came into the field. They started to find uh, new examples. And the final classification was obtained, I guess, in uh, 76, 77 by Victor Katz. But uh, all examples were found before. Well, now. Speaking of infinite dimensional superalgebras, again, if you want to study infinite dimensional superalgebras, we should start with the same uh, z-graded algebras, superalgebras, say graded simple, and let us say the dimension dimensions grow not too fast, mm, something like this polynomial. Well, the first examples were found by physicists. Nevier, Schwartz, and Ramon. They found such superalgebras, and their even part contained Virasoro. So um, they were called superconformal algebras. Because the Virasoro algebra and the corresponding group plays an outstanding role in conformal field theory. And then they took these super extensions and introduced them in the models uh, instead of the Virasoro algebra, and that was quite interesting. And they started the search of other examples of this type. Then Katz and Van der Leur analyzed the works of Navier Schwarz and Ramon, and they uh, came with the recognition that actually what they were looking for was were, um, graded simple Lie superalgebras. Let us say that the dimensions are uniformly bounded. Let's be modest. Not only polynomial, but uniformly bounded. And of course, we want the even part to contain the Virasoro. That immediately established links with the theorem of Mathieu. And they conjectured that maybe the analog of Mathieu theorem holds. So here are the examples. They conjectured that all superconformal algebras are of the following type. Well, uh, let us uh, we consider super derivations of um, polynomials in one Laurent variable, which is even, and finitely many Grassmann variables. That is kind of an analog both of 
W and to Furasoro. And it has some anal analogous subalgebra, special Hamiltonian contact, and their um, and their deformations. If we drop this assumption that the even part contains Verasoro, then maybe the only ones would be, you know, a fine Kasmudi superalgebra. So I forgot to say that the first two examples that appeared in this classification. Uh, had an Im immense impact on mathematics. That this was, that's how Katz-Moody algebras were introduced. Moody came to them from a different point of view. Uh, so that was a conjecture made in 89. This conjecture stood for seven years. In 96, Independently, Cheng and Katz and Grossman, Leitas, Shepachkina No, no, no. Uh, this is my advantage. I can pronounce this name. <laughs> uh, found another super algebra, another super conformal algebra. <coughs> but the difference is that Cheng and Katz, who called them, that's algebra CK6, 6, 6 for a number of parameters, CK, not for Calvin Klein, um, and Grossman Leitis Shepachkina published that paper in Vietnamese mathematical journal. And they put it in archive but in the section of high energy oh. physics. <laughs> so I'm, af I'm afraid that is in, in my subsequent paper, I adopted this notation because I was not aware of this paper and did not refer to this paper because how one is supposed to know. <laughs> OK. So they found a new example of a superconformal <laughs> algebra. Now the conjecture was modified. The new conjecture was maybe all superconformal algebras are as expected, plus this one. There were good reasons to believe that the new conjecture is true. By the way, it is still open in full generality. But the reasons were following. So let's go back to our Lee super algebras. Let us consider its zero part, which is just a finite dimensional Lee super algebra. So it has even component and odd component. And let us suppose that it is not solvable. Well, if you assume solvability, that leads to kind of small cases. If it is not solvable, it was known that the even part is also not solvable. Then it is known, it was known maybe to Sophus Lee, that it contains the famous algebra of SL2, the algebra of two by two matrices of zero trace. It is three dimensional, and the basis of this algebra is always denoted EFH in all books. So H corresponds to this element. Now, uh, this SL2 acts every Li is a module of um, this SL2. Every finite dimensional module of SL2 and over any other semi-simple finite dimensional Lie algebra is a direct sum of irreducibles. And in every dimension, there is just one irreducible module over SL2. So basically, there are fine, as modules, there are finitely many types for these LIs. And now, if we consider the eigenvalues of this operator uh, acting on L, 
it has finitely many eigenvalues. Let us say starting from minus m to m. Finitely many eigenvalues. The minimal, absolutely unavoidable eigenvalues are negative 2, 0, and 2 because they occur already in SL2. That's the minimal case. Now let's consider that minimal case. Minimal case, L becomes of a direct sum of three eigenspaces. Now it's really terrible because there are three gradations on L. L is a super algebra. L is Z graded. Now it is a direct sum of these three eigenspaces. Well, now I have to start with a different story. which goes back to mid-thirties. In mid-thirties, three distinguished authors, John von Neumann, Pasquale Jordan, in America he is called Jordan, but really he is Jordan, and Eugene Wigner, decided to generalize the formalism of quantum mechanics. The usual observables of quant in quantum mechanics are Hermitian matrices uh, or Hermitian apparatus in the Hilbert space. If A and B are Hermitian matrices, then the linear combination with real coefficients is again a Hermitian matrix. But their product is does not need to be. So the natural operation in the space of Hermitian matrices is this, the so-called symmetric product. So these three distinguished authors formulated the program in, of three steps. Step one, well, find the most important properties of this intrinsic operation and take them for axioms. Then study uh, all other objects that satisfy these axioms. I, I said three points. I count that I have two. Well, doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, for the most important properties, it reminds me, if, if I had to give uh, this lecture in America during the presidential campaign, it reminds me the debates of Perry. He said that he has three, in three departments that have to be eliminated. When he was asked which, he named two. And asked about the third one, he said, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So for the most important properties, they chose two. Commutativity. And the second one which is now called Jordan or Jordan identity. Sort of weak associativity. Well, and now algebras with these properties are called, well, Jordan algebra. Algebras. So what I, let me mention some examples of Jordan algebras. If you take an arbitrary associative algebra and replace the ordinary multiplication by commutation, you get a Lie algebra. If you replace by anti-commutation, well, with one half or without, doesn't matter, you get a Jordan algebra. Another example. Suppose that star is the so-called involution that is anti-automorphism of order two, like transposition of matrices. And we consider Hermitian elements, symmetric elements. <coughs> then this is a subalgebra in, by the way, this algebra is called A plus. This algebra is A minus, and this is A plus. 
this is a Jordan algebra as a algebra of A plus. There is a third example. Let V be a vector space with a symmetric bilinear form. We consider the direct sum of the field and the space, and we have to define multiplication here. The identity is the identity. But if you want to multiply two elements from V, you do it via the form. That's also a Jordan algebra. And there is the most interesting and important example found by those distinguished authors. If you take the algebra of Actonians, this is a very interesting eight-dimensional algebra. <coughs> if you start with real numbers and double it in a certain way, you get complex numbers. If you double complex numbers, basically in the same way, you get quaternions. If you double quaternions, you get actonions. At each step, you lose something. When you move from complex numbers to mm, quaternions, you lose commutativity. When you move qu from quaternions to actonions, you use associativity. This algebra is not associative. For many years, I thought, what do we lose when we move from real numbers to complex numbers? It seems that you only gain, but. <laughs> uh, you lose the fact that the evolution is identical, but. <laughs> OK, if you consider Hermitian three by three matrices of Octonius, that's also a Jordan algebra of dimension 27. And the next step, well, the program of for generalization of quantum mechanics somehow did not go far. But in 60s, Jacques Tietz gave a breast a second life in Jordan algebras. Suppose that we have a Lie algebra, which contains SL2 and the only eigenvalues of the element H are negative 2, 0, and 2. Let us take the component which belong to the eigenvalue 2. Well, this, uh, the element E of the basis belongs to eigenvalue 2. The element F belongs to eigenvalue negative 2. Let us define a new multiplication on this space. A circle B is a triple commutator, A, F, B. When you multiply eigenvectors, the eigenvalues add. So this belongs to 2, this belongs to negative 2, this to 2. Total, we are again in L2. And Tietz noticed that with this operation, this is a Jordan algebra. Moreover, this construction can be reversed. Every Jordan algebra can be obtained in this way. So if you have a Jordan algebra, you can construct a Lie algebra with these properties. This construction is known as Tietz counter Kircher construction. And in this way, well, uh, Tietz was able to construct models for all exceptional Lie algebras. This is a very interesting problem. You know, Sophos Lie thought that uh, he, uh, at some point that E8 doesn't exist. How do you prove that E8 exists? You need models, constructions. And that was done in this way by, so Jordan algebras are building blocks for exceptional Lie algebras. Now coming back to our super algebras. In this minimal case, we have got a super conformal Jordan al super algebra. And I don't need to define what is a Jordan superalgebra, because the class of Jordan algebras is a variety. A superalgebra is a Jordan superalgebra if it's Grassmann envelope is a Jordan algebra. <coughs> well, so there was a problem of classification of Jordan superalgebras. And in 2001, in the joint paper with Martinez and Katz, we did it.
And uh, our classification completely confirmed this extended conjecture. The su journal superalgebras were of the following type, mostly. It's also a very interesting construction, so I will mention it. Suppose that we have, let A be a commutative algebra, a commutative associative algebra with a Poisson bracket. Well, you can take a Poisson bracket of the classical mechanics. Uh, basically, it means that this is a Lie bracket, so you get a Lie algebra. And if you fix one element, then with respect to the other element, it's a derivation, like the usual Poisson bracket. Let us double it. So consider a direct sum of two copies. And define a new multiplication. The new multiplication on A is A, is the old multiplication. Whenever you need to multiply even element by an odd element, it's old multiplication. Whenever you need to multiply two odd elements, it's a bracket. In this way, you get a Jordan superalgebra. This is due to Cantor. It's called Cantor double of A. So we proved that there are two types of superconformal uh, algebras. You have to take this algebra with some bracket and double it, or you have to, there exists some exceptional Jordan superalgebra which corresponds to CK6, which we called, well, JCK6. Well, so this is the partial case. And there is another very important, also partial case, which was done by a group of people. Uh, finally, the final point by Cheng and Katz. I will explain. Suppose that we have an infinite dimensional z graded algebra or super algebra, doesn't matter. And now let us be modest. The dimensions of all components are equal, not only bounded by are equal. It means that in each of them we can find the basis, some basis of Li. And whenever you multiply, uh, two basic elements, the degree becomes i plus j. So it can be decomposed as a direct, as a linear combination of elements of this type, k from 1 to d. These are just the so-called structural constants d cubed functions that define multiplication on this algebra. Even before Wedderburn structure theory was developed in early 20th century, that's how algebras were studied by structural constants. Now suppose that we mentioned we managed to find such basis that all these functions are polynomial. <laughs> But I tried, but it seems that there is nothing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now suppose that all these d cubed functions of i and j are polynomial. In i and j. In what? <laughs> well, of course, it seems terribly special case. But somehow all important examples were captured. And it has connection with another dramatic story in mathematics. You know, let, we could, like a physicist like to do, we could, instead of considering uh, basic elements and uh, general elements, we could consider this generate generating functions e, i, k, z, 
minus i minus 1, i goes over all integers. z is a formal variable. This is just a power series which is infinite in both directions. Now this condition of polynomiality is equivalent to the following condition that for every, let us say, p, e, for every e, any two such infinite formal series, there exist n such that this is equal to 0. Polynomiality is equivalent to this, which is the main, it's called the axiom of locality, which is the main axiom in the definition of vertex operator algebras. And this is another dramatic story. In early 80s, John Mackay noticed that the minimal uh, kind of irreducible, minimal dimension of an irreducible module over the biggest parody group, the monster, was very close, the difference was, was one, with the coefficient in the modular function. Since these numbers were, you know, six digits, the probability of a coincidence just uh, was not very high. And then, uh, Norton, uh, Conway, and Thompson formulated a conjecture that probably the monster group has a degraded representation uh, such that the graded character was a modular function. This conjecture became known as a moonshine conjecture, and the name just showed the attitude <laughs> to the conjecture. I know a great mathematician who gave a lecture at that time and made a bet with somebody in the audience for a box of good wine that this conjecture won't be settled in the 20th century. But a strange thing was found. By the time the bet was made, uh, in a way, these representations were already in the literature. But the literature in theoretical physics, in conformal field theory, Physicists don't like to consider elements. They like to consider this, uh, well, sometimes they're called formal distributions of fields. Uh, the story also involves Sobolev and Schwartz, who introduced uh, generalized functions. And generalized functions are not functions. They are functionals in, on functions. And if you consider the Fourier decomposition, they're infinite in both directions. And therefore, you cannot multiply them. If, if, if I use the same variable, you can't multiply these elements. You will end up with infinite sums. So they replaced, it was already in the works of Sobolev and Schwartz. Uh, if you want to multiply this infinite Fourier series, you replace the impossible multiplication by countably many possible multiplications. <laughs> and so you, what is the nth operation? You consider this product and take residue. You change n, you have many operations. Locality means that all products but finitely many are equal to zero. Well, so, that led to the definition of a vertex operator algebra and conformal algebra. What's a conformal algebra? It's a collection of uh, infinite of formal Fourier series with the condition that for any two elements, they are pairwise local. This axiom holds. And uh, Looking at this series, you can differentiate them. So it's, uh, there is one linear operator that works and that acts on it. Well, so it is a mod, if you have a space and a linear operator that works on it, it's a, it's a module over polynomials. The first, if you want a classification, the first assumption was that it's, let us say that it is finite module over polynomials. And simple conformal algebras with this property were classified. Uh, this finite means that basically that the dimensions of all Li's are bounded. 
a very difficult work, but very beautiful, and the techniques is very different. Basically, the main idea is that you view in this way, if you go to fields or conformal field uh, Fourier series, you can view these infinite dimensional objects as kind of almost finite dimensional, but to polynomials. So in two cases, the conjecture was confirmed. Now, you can also define modules over superconformal algebra, say polynomial modules. What's a polynomial module? Representation is the same. You assume that your module is z graded. Uh, you introduce formal uh, Fourier series. You assume locality. All the same. And Katz and his students uh, classified practically all irreducible representations over superconformal algebras in this way, this polynomiality assumption. And for the exceptional case, it was done recently independently by Kass and his student and uh, Martinez and me. Different approaches. The papers have not appeared yet. Mm. Well, and we also, we prove, well, it is easy to see that they are highest weight modules, but we studied different Borel subalgebras and they are not conjugate. So, it's more or less complementary works. Now, now I'm ready to formulate the theorem and the conjecture. That was the reason for me to choose this topic. If you want to study representations of this superconformal algebras, so we have You have a Lee super algebra, well known, sort of all dimensions are equal. Uh, let us say that they are all polynomial. And you want to study modules. Well, it is natural to start, to start with modules, which are also graded, and all dimensions are finite. Sometimes they are called Harish Chandra modules. Well, if you assume polynomial assumption due to a long series of works, this is known. Now, my conjecture is, is that it's always, all these modules are either highest weights And let us say the grading is one-sided, which is not very interesting in this case. But, oh, very interesting. Or polynomial. So this special case is really not very special. And I can prove it. This is a joint work with Martinez. Um, that on the Jordan level, for Jordan superconformal algebras, this is the case. Uh, and this kind of changes the game because now the classification of all Harish Chandra modules are within reach. If you prove that they are almost always polynomial, you use absolutely different techniques and you can get it. If you consider Harish Chandra modules over the Virasoro algebra, Olivier Mathieu proved this conjecture, not knowing the conjecture. Uh, <laughs> he proved it. Again, very complicated proof. Maybe this could be a general approach to all of this uh, to the study of all these modules to prove polynomiality, and that would lead to various types of modules. Thank you.